Hello and welcome to the last in our series of uh, cryptic podcast meets with the artists behind what's going to be a fantastic night at the Cryptic Arts Pit Party at the Barbican, uh, the Pit Theatre at the Barbican, tonight, November the 19th, and tomorrow, November the 20th. Now, we've got something a bit different for you today, because I'm going to introduce you to the wonderful Anna Davies, who is the brains behind the podcast, and as the one that made all the magic happen. So, hello, Anna. Hello. I don't know if I'm the brains behind this. I think you're driving it. <laughs> Oh no, I'm, I've always, you know, you've got to understand as a presenter, I'm basically a dancing monkey. I just do, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you write the scripts, you know, <laughs> you're the one that comes in after. Basically what's happened, folks, is we'd, you know, Anna will appear, it, we'd have a chat with the interviewees, then um, we'll do an interview and then she comes back and goes, and goes mm, yeah, that was good, that was good. And then she cuts out all the waffle because <laughs> they've all run over a tad um, <laughs> because my stories were waffly. So, you know, sterling work has been done. This so, might be the one I need to do the most work on. Yes, I feel so. <laughs> um, so what's going to happen is you're going to interview me, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going to interview right. you because you'll be on the other side of the desk for a change. Considering you've asked everyone else, I've got to ask you the obligatory, what is your one line bio? Because like, what do you tell people about who you are, what you're doing? Um, and do you know yours off by heart like everyone else? Yeah, well, mine is, one line is different. So here we go. Yeah. <gasps> are you ready, folks? Hi, I'm Mick Scarlett and I am a broadcaster, journalist, uh, TV presenter, actor, singer, songwriter, um, and I also run my own access consultancy where I work with uh, architects and developers to make buildings accessible and I work with clients to make sure what they do is accessible, so services, uh, planned changes in business structure, all that kind of thing. So I have a fun life where I'm arty and creative, I'm currently writing for some magazines, I'm doing a bit of online stuff with a, uh, um, a kind of chat show called, um, I don't know what it's called actually, it was on Disability Horizons TV where myself and two other guys just basically waffle a lot and we have wonderful guests, so that's quite fun. Uh, and then I'm working on kind of big sort of accessy projects and in between all that, I'm the producer at Cryptic, so I'm helping Jamie and all the wonderful artists sort of fulfil their artistic um, vision uh, and I'm the one that's running around trying to make sure that people have the props they want and the tech they want and that they've got cabs when they need them and all this kind of stuff. So um, that's me. Bad yeah. one line. It's a bad one line. No, that was really good. You got a lot of exciting things on your plate, like coming out mm. as well. Um, so you mentioned a bit about Cryptic there. How did you personally start working with Cryptic? How, what got you into the organisation? I'd, I'd heard about Jamie already. Yeah. Bubbling under in the six. I've been on the disability arts scene for so long. You know, I mean, when, when, when I started, it really was kind of, you were playing in kind of church halls and to, it was very small. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny because I've watched the, the scene grow and blossom and, and, and really amazing talents develop. And Jamie was one of them. And then um, Jamie contacted me and asked me, would I, at the last cryptic, do the... Um, the kind of after show debate chat thing. So I was gonna just compare, basically do what I've done on the podcast live. Uh, and I saw the show and I was blown away. Uh, you know, it was an amazing night of entertainment. Jamie's show was just phenomenal, uh, but everyone was great. And I was like, this is, this is really great, I love this. So then when I saw the advert going, oh, would you like to take part? I thought, well, I'll apply. So I applied to be an artist. Oh, really? but, uh, but Jamie called me and said, well, really, you're a bit more kind of established than we, you know, kind of 30 years bit established. A little bit heartbroken because while I'm established as a presenter and a journalist and that kind of stuff, I've not really ever got to do my, this was going to be art, man. I was going to be all art. Um, but uh, yeah, you kind of, uh, you have to face up to those things. You know, people tell you no. I always get told no. <laughs> anyway, so then I saw the producer's gig and I thought, ah, because when I started out, I started out in music. And when I was doing music, I, as well as being a musician, I was doing a lot of band management um, and tour management. And basically tour managing is very much like theatrical producing. It's kind of arranging everything so that it all runs well and then dealing with creatives. 
as they have their various meltdowns. Yeah. And I've always found myself quite good at calming the situation, bigging people up and calming the situation down. And I'm also quite good at going away and telling people off without it sounding like I'm telling them off. <laughs> so so uh, kind of I thought I'd apply and I got it. And I was just like, wow. And it's been a real honour. One, because, you know, I've never really worked on anything where access is so embedded and it's there's so much i mean i've learned so much about theatrical creative access myself from this project but it, you know there's nothing that we can't organize there's nothing that we can we can't alter to make it so that it's accessible yeah both for the audience and the art because everybody else is a little bit they're, they're proper artists and so they're all a little bit you know you've seen folks you've seen you've met the artists some are introverts some are a little bit more you know but most are arty and most also have this we've all discussed the kind of barriers and one of them has all been that core lack of belief. We've not been told you can do this. Um, and everybody involved has got that. Mm -hmm. Whereas I am this bubbling mountain of kind of cross between confidence and arrogance in that I believe everybody is brilliant and they should know it. So I think that's one of my, going to be one of my prime jobs as we get closer to the night, which of course, means it's probably already happened and while you're watching this folks that i've been going yeah you're brilliant um and so you can guarantee that as you all sit down tonight or tomorrow or to watch it online and sort of see what, what's going to happen you know that backstage i'm going to be there with pom-poms going yeah you're great and you're going to do a really great show. and that's going to be my job really i mean it's so important in when you're doing a big performance like that, that you have the cheerleader though. You don't like, that is a key role. <laughs> you know, it's funny, like I said, asking all these people about the barriers and, you know, I thought everyone was going to be like, you know, external attitude, access to yeah. buildings, you know, understanding of neurodiversity, all this. And it wasn't. The key thread was a lack of belief that mm -hmm. I could do this, that this was a career I could follow. And it's, you know, I, I, I'm really lucky. I've had a really long career, you know, and it's, it's as you can tell from my bio, it's a scattergun. So I've done loads and I've never gone into a room thinking I shouldn't be there. And so I want, if I can bring that, if that's, if that's all I bring to the table is that everyone leaves Cryptic and they've learned a load of creative stuff from Jamie and they've all been mentored. And the thing that I bring is that I give them all just a tiny core of arrogant confidence. <laughs> And you talked a little bit about it there, about talking to everyone else about the barriers, but I wanted to ask you as well, because we've asked everyone else, um, and you were at a bit of a different position. So what barriers do you think you faced in your career? And your I think the, the, the one, uh, I mean, the one about attitude it was at the start. When I was young, and I, I wanted to be in music for as long as I could remember. And I was always told by everybody, oh, you can't do it. My music teacher told me I was tone deaf. Ha, ha, ha. Um, proved him wrong. But also, um, I was lucky because just when I hit that age where you go, oh, what am I going to be when I grow up? I know, I'll be a pop star. I had Ian Jury, who was like number one in the charts. And I'd turn on top of the pops and there would be a guy who walked with calipers and I walked with calipers. So it was like, oh, he's like me. I'll be a pop star like him. So yeah. for me, it, it wasn't that big a thing. Whereas there hasn't been that since. So I think that lots of younger people don't have that mm. instant massive role model. You've got to find your role models now. Whereas back then they were on top of the pops at seven o'clock. It's like, woo, number one, Ian Jury. Number one, Mick Scarlet. Sounds obvious. So that was that. Once I started doing it, then I found that pretty much all of the industries that I wanted to go into were the one the word now is ableist but back then it was just wankers so basically they were all the kind of people that just wouldn't believe you could do it and i you know a lot of the bands i were in were massive and i mean when i say massive i mean you know i was playing three thousand to six thousand capacity venues i was touring with major acts we had you know um one of my bands got a residency in a club where every other band that played there got signed and they'd do one gig and we did a four week residency because we sold out so every night for four weeks so and yet we couldn't get a deal so it's why i kind of fell out of love with music because i just kept getting re rejected over and over and over and over again so then i got into television by mistake <laughs> basically got spotted doing a gig where, where one of my computers blew up and i talked like this and told jokes and they came up and said well you didn't 
you know, get bottled off stage because you were funny. Would you like to do a screen test? Suddenly I was a TV presenter and I did a load of, I mean, you know, I was, I, I was, I did loads of first sort of stuff. Um, I did, uh, I was like, the, you know, first kids TV presenter, first, this, I won Emmys, um, loads of stuff. Yeah. The thing is, is what, what disability arts used to be really little and it was, it was kind of a bit niche. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to get on, you had to break out of that. And you had to, and I, I, most of my music career was spent doing mainstream gigs in venues that weren't accessible. I mean, this is before the Disability Discrimination Act. So venues weren't really accessible and you kind of fought to get in to see a band, let alone fought to get on the stage, mm -hmm. which meant you had to be kind of with, you had to have an impairment that was going to impact you as little as possible or, or the ability to say, I don't care if I crawl or whatever, which I used to do all the while. The thing about cryptic is cryptic is saying, no, that's, that's old, that's out of the way. We yeah. want to say, let's make it so that anyone can follow their artistic dream in an environment that is safe, supportive, where access is built in. And that's all types of access. That's not just a ramp and a loo. You know, they're important, but it's everything. And I think that's, that's what I've learned the most from this is all about you know, access riders. I love the workshops that we've provided. I love the mentoring. That whole lifting people up um, is why it's so wonderful. And what's great is it's going to be such a great show because of it. You've got really talented people that have been given every support to build a great piece that yeah. they will then go on and further and create more. And I mean, that's the whole drive of, of what this is, is it's a showcase of stuff that will get bigger and, you know, there will be bigger shows coming out of each one of the, the short pieces that, you know, people will see. And yeah. that, is, is kind of wonderful because, and it kind of proves it can be done without it having to be this big deal and you not having to, you know, put yourself out and go on stage and think, crikey, I don't often need the loo. Oh, well, I'll just have to do the whole show and then wait and then sit in the wings while the other band goes on because I can't get off until the end of the night, <laughs> which is stuff I've done. <laughs> Sitting there going, so uh <laughs> which yeah. adds a free song to the performance but uh yeah <laughs> so what are you most excited about um in terms of the show which will be airing tonight because this episode mm. is going to be on the 19th of november um what are you most excited for um come the performance tonight i couldn't i wouldn't say any particular act because it's a it's such a an eclectic roller coaster of a night that kind of every every single performance is going to be different mm -hmm. so it's going to be funny and then thought provoking and then challenging and then uplifting and so you're going to be doing this all night and i think that's going to be the most exciting bit because this really does show the breadth of talent out there and so there's something for everyone there's and, it, and even if it's not your thing, you're going to find it is your thing. Um, I've fallen in love with a couple of the acts that really I didn't think I was going to like. And I'm like, oh, wow. Mm. And I couldn't name one over another that I'm looking forward to. I think it's just going to be such a great night. And I, it, one of the things I'm looking forward to, actually, is being with Jamie when each show is finished. Because... Mm. You know, Jamie, it, it, however much the artists have been creating their pieces, Jamie has been this wonderful captain guiding the ship. And I can't wait to be with them to see, they, well, I hope they'll be euphoric because they <laughs> deserve to be. Um, and yeah, it's, there's no, if you, you know, I, as, as I've said on the end of all the other pieces, you absolutely have to get your tickets if you can. If you can get to the barber can do it, you've got the 19th tonight and the 20th tomorrow. If there's tickets left by now, then get them. If not, watch it online. Mm -hmm. right? And see, and then see, and then watch what happens. Because each of those artists are going to go on to do big things. And there's something quite real pleasing for me to know that I played a very small role in that and I'm going to watch them all and feel like a kind of loving father that goes oh look at them watch them fly and that's it so uh and, and annoyingly there won't be uh, an after show party because of covid so I can't even there was a planned after show party on the Friday <laughs> that met, and I was like are you sure 
because that means that Saturday might be a little bit more hungover, yeah. but now because of COVID, there isn't. So come along. It's all safe. It's all wonderful. But if you are a bit worried, watch it online. It's going to be available for two, two weeks, I think, on the Barbican website. But whatever you do, don't miss it because it's going to be great. Amazing. Well, I think I was going to ask you to sell it, but you did. You sold it right at the end. So That's That's well, thank you very much, Mick, for being the interviewee for a change. Um, and that's it from me. And that's it from me. So bye, bye, bye. And don't forget, see you tonight. If you see a, a worried looking blonde haired person in a wheelchair, you know that I'm trying to fix something. So.